Lila. <laughs> so good to be here with you today. And I just want to come off of this video and say, one of the, Ryan was asking me this morning, how are you feeling? You're preaching, yay. And I was like, you know what? I actually feel really good. I feel really peaceful. And part of it, I think, is a credit to the work that this community has done to move us in the direction of growth. EF has been a really instrumental piece in my life of just helping me learn more about myself and learn how to be more fully who God, who I, God has made me to be in honest and in, um, full of integrity. And so I highly re recommend um, the EF course is just an invitation for you to step towards um, growth with Jesus. But I think it's also a testament to this community just being such a gracious place, like a community that is just full of people who are kind and gracious and um, eager to love and learn how to love each other well. So thank you for having me today. Thank you for um, being part of this community. So I want to start by asking you, when's the last time you lost something? <laughs> so I, it is kind of funny. This was my opening question. But on my drive here, I had to go home because I actually lost, I forgot my notes. And then I noticed I forgot my phone. And I was late because my husband's out of town and I had my kids. I didn't forget them. But I was like, oh my goodness, this is my talk, yes. This is not new for me. Years ago when I was in college, I was um, working, I work with a student ministry called InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and I was in charge of a student conference. So we had students from all over California and Nevada coming together to learn and grow, and I was in charge of their money. I was the registrar, and I had all the registration and, and um, scholarship forms. And at the end of the conference, I had this big stack of cash, because this was years ago and people didn't have Apple Pay and all that stuff. You see where I'm going. <laughs> I had the money, and what I should have done is I should have driven to a credit union or a bank and gotten a cashier's check. That was like a decade later that I realized that was something I could have done. No, what I did was I stuffed all the money into a gift bag that like, I had gotten at the conference that was probably this big, and so it was just this tight packed money with like $5,000 in it. And I, what my job was is I had to wait a week, and then the director of the conference, Mike, he was going to come to my house and pick up all the money. And then he would submit it, turn it in, all this stuff. I don't recommend this process for conference registration, especially not with a 22-year-old. So Mike comes over, and I'm ready. I go upstairs, and I look around, and I look on my desk, and it's gone. This bag is gone. I freak out. I look under my desk. I look on my bed. I look in my bag. I look everywhere I think it could be. And it was not there. Imagine how you would feel in this moment. <laughs> Downstairs is my supervisor, and I have to walk down and tell him I lost the cash. Before I do that, I play it a little cool, and I start searching all over my house. But I'm kind of like, it's the kind of where I don't want to give him the vibe that I don't know where the money is. And I'm like, oh, I'll be right back. Got to change the laundry. And I'm just looking in the cupboards, looking in the everywhere I could think of. I'm looking. But I had to tell him. I lost the money. And I didn't have a solution. <laughs> I was 22. I don't know how long it would take me to save 5000 to pay it back. I just felt really horrible. And days later, I was still defeated and just really, really sad that I had done this. And I was walking in my room, and I look up, and something caught the corner of my eye. And I had this room that had just these really tall, it was like a walk-in closet, but there were accordion doors that kind of opened and closed it. And on one of the accordion doors, I had kind of put a little hook on it, and now it was coming back to me. I had hung the bag on the hook, but I'm so short that it just was not in my eye line at all. <laughs> but imagine the relief I felt when I saw that bag of cash hanging on that hook. I pull it down, I run, I grab my phone, I call Mike. Mike, I found the money. It was relief. Losing things loss, it's just an inevitable part of life. It comes in so many forms, from things like losing an AirPod or your phone or your preaching notes, to losing a stack of cash and not knowing what you're going to do. We lose relationships, loved ones, we lose jobs, 
Sometimes the things that we lose, we can't even name. They're just less tangible. We lose our sense of hope, our sense of belonging or security. I remember when I was a freshman in college, I was living at home and going to school for the first couple years, working, commuting to classes. And one day I go out and my car is just gone. And I, again, was just like, oh my goodness, what am I gonna do? Thankfully I had insurance and so I got a rental car. And so my mom and I were just like, my, fam my parents were like, okay, nothing can happen to this rental car. And so we park it in the garage, we're like keeping it for safekeeping. Then my mom's car gets stolen a week later. <laughs> So we're just like, what is happening? And this wasn't the first time we had, our house had been robbed twice before, like 10 years earlier. And I realized even though we had insurance, even though we were able to actually recover both cars, get them back, something had shifted. It was almost like this sense of safety or this sense of like, this lighthearted way of moving through the world was now kind of shifted and different, and I found myself actually walking up to my car at, you know, from class, and I, I'd go to put the key in, and my hand was shaking. And I realized I'd noticed, like, I'd find myself looking under the car to make sure no one was under it. It was just like this shifty kind of darting way entered in. And I just wanted to feel safe, and I didn't know how. I think it can be difficult to understand the feeling of losing something until you've actually experienced it, and you've had something really important at risk. But with, with loss comes longing, and with longing comes action. And today we're going to continue our series in the book of Luke, chapter 15, where we look at the parables that Jesus offers and consider the transformational power of longing amidst loss. Now, these parables are not just these standalone teachings. Even though they might be familiar, they're not standalone teachings. They're actually a response in a dialogue. Well, what happens is there's a crowd of people, and they're gathering around Jesus in Luke 15. And there are just this gnarly, diverse group of people. You've got the Pharisees and the teachers of law, and they're just like feeling good coming to Jesus, like we're in this club Jesus is a rabbi, he's teaching, he's te healing, he's talking about the kingdom of God. This is our jam. And then you've got these tax collectors who are just despised by the local community. And you've got people that are just labeled sinners. They're probably the misfits. They're probably the people that have, are living in scandalous ways to the society. And this group of Pharisees and tax, uh, not Pharisees, uh, leaders of the law, teachers of the law, this group of religious leaders, they look at this crowd and they see the way Jesus is treating this community. And he's not treating anybody differently. He's not treating them as religious leaders any differently than he's treating these tax collectors and these misfits. And they are, they are downright bothered by this. And so they mutter to themselves, I love this, they mutter to themselves, who is this guy? How dare he act such, how dare he act such an, um, commit such an act of social impropriety? Really, that's what they're saying. They say, Jesus welcomes sinners and tax collectors. He even eats with them. And Jesus, even though they're talking to themselves, enters the dialogue and he says, he offers three parables, and they all have this common theme, theme of lostness. And last week, Ryan walked us through the parable of the lost sheep and highlighted the value of pursuit, as well as God's relentless pursuit of us. And today, we're going to pick up in Luke 15, 8 through 10, and we're going to look at the parable of the lost coin. So let me read that in just a second. Thank you. So he just picks up in the second parable. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. 
In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of God over one sinner who repents. Now, like this woman, all of us have probably lost things. We know this feeling of being like, oh no, where is it? But there's something a little different about this passage that the the Pharisees, the religious leaders, would have picked up on. So the way that Jesus describes this woman is a woman who has 10 coins. And in the Bible background commentary that kind of picks up on the historical context of the time, it says that those 10 coins likely represented her dowry. These coins represent, it means that her family probably was not one of means, and this was kind of her hope for the future. So for her, and not just a hope, but I think even a, a, a sense of, um, like it was a sense of identity for the future. Like without marriage, she did not have much to rely on. And to lose one of these coins was deeply, deeply distressing. It's not like when you're in bed and you drop your pen and you're like, eh, I don't need my pen right now. You know, like, no, this was like, stop everything. The plan has changed. This is my number one priority right now. And the, the amount of coins was probably likely two weeks wage. And again, it just tells us like how dire this situation is. There's a lot at stake for her, and it's evident in her reaction. So wrapped up in her longing for the lost coin is her future. And she acts immediately. She grabs a lamp. She's searching everywhere for it. Let's switch to the next. And there is this deep, deep relief when she finds it. And what does she do? She calls up her friends. She goes outside and she waves over her neighbors. And she's like, oh my goodness, this coin that I was just like freaking out over, this thing that just meant so much to me, it's found. And I know that you don't know what's been happening in my house the last 20 you know, minutes or 20 hours, but you are coming over. We are celebrating because the joy that I feel is like abounding enough for all of us. What was lost was now found, and that was worth celebrating. In the book um, Bittersweet, I don't know if you've read it, this was the author Susan Cain. She also wrote the book The Power of, or The Power, Quiet, The Power of Introverts or something, but she's an author and she talks about this feeling of yearning this feeling of longing that captures this woman in the parable's drive to find. And Susan Cain says, longing is momentum in disguise. It is active. It is not passive. Touched with creative, the tender, the divine, when we long for something or someone, we reach for it. We move towards it. The place you suffer, in other words, is the same place you care profoundly and you care enough to act. That's what the woman did in this parable. She acted both in her search and also in her celebrating. And Jesus wants the Pharisees to connect some dots here. What dots do you think Jesus wants them to connect? What do you think Jesus is trying to communicate what truths about the kingdom of God is Jesus wanting them to grasp, wanting them to see what is missing. Last week, Ryan opened his sermon with the the idea of um, overvalue, those of us who tend to overvalue or undervalue ourselves. And the Pharisees are straight up overvalue. They are just like the kings of certainty. They know the law, they keep the law, and they feel good about themselves. And um, they're the ones who are, are doing, the, like, doing things the right way. They've made good choices. They're the role models of society. They're the ones to look up to. And the problem is their pursuit for right, righteousness has caused them to miss the forest among the trees. They are so content in their practices that they lack any sense of longing, any sense of longing to know why, why Jesus is different, why Jesus is causing this dissonance within them. And instead of asking Jesus, which they could have done, 
they end up just grumpy, they're angry, they're complaining to each other. And actually, what's at the root of their anger is actually resentment. Maybe they are just offended. It's, maybe it's cultural for them. They're just offended that people who are living in such ways are just causing them to just get ruffled. Their feathers are ruffled and they're just frustrated. Why are they here? But I wonder if the resentment is actually about envy. I wonder if they feel like I've done everything right. They haven't. I've sacrificed. They haven't. How come you're giving them the same kind of love you would give us? Or how come you're giving them the same kind of affirmation, fellowship, this like radical act of hospitality to share a meal? We've worked harder for this. It's not fair. Brene Brown, I, she's like a social worker researcher, and she talks about resentment. And she's like, actually, the root of resentment is not anger. It's jealousy. It's envy. It's, I love this description. She says, it's like getting a knife held up to your throat, but you're the one holding the knife. Right? And the irony here is that they end up being the ones in this moment to slander and criticize the God that they are seeking so hard to worship. And this collection of parables in Luke 15 is, you know, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and next week, the lost sons. These are an invitation for them. It's an opportunity for Jesus to illustrate to them the the value and the nature of the kingdom of God. And there's just this interesting contrast in in the impression that Jesus offers in these parables with what the experience of the religious leaders is, are, is. So on one hand, you've got the woman, and she is the one to lose, she's lost something. So you've got the woman, and she's the one who loses something, her missing coin. And once she does, she stops everything, and she looks for it. And then when she finds it, she celebrates with her friends, and it's just overcome with joy. And then you have these religious leaders, and they already possess a faith in God. And yet, they're the ones who are judging those who have gathered to learn and listen from Jesus. Rather than celebrate that like more people are, are yearning and leaning their hearts toward God, they complain that these people haven't earned the right to be here. I love this imagery of this one um, writer who captured the heart of Jesus' message in this parable. And... It's as if Jesus is saying, so they personified Jesus, they said, it's as if Jesus is saying, those who are lost are in need of me and are so important to me that I am willing to invest my time. I am willing to endure inconvenience, sadness, work effort, unpleasant circumstances, even gossip and loss of reputation by you for the very chance to bring them back, to bring back what was lost. And I think this story is a story of God's relentless pursuit and lavish love for us. It's steeped in longing that demands action. And this parable is God's invitation to the Pharisees to hear and respond. It's a radical act of hospitality. And I wonder... As we hear these parables, as we go through these stories, and we hear the same invitation, I wonder if we can let ourselves be found. In this parable, the woman is searching and searching for this lost coin. She isn't flippant about it. She's desperate. And she's longing for this coin to be found and doing whatever it takes to find it. And when she does, it's not just satisfying. It is like worthy of announcement, of pronouncement, of celebration. In fact, Jesus says that's what heaven is like when someone who is lost changes their way and turns their way towards Jesus, towards God. You don't turn your nose up at somebody who is desperate and yearning to be found. 
you delight in God's heart and share in the celebration. And Jesus is inviting the Pharisees to see that they are missing it and that rather than judge, they are invited to share in God's heart. And if they did, they would see that what is happening right here with this ragtag group of people just coming to learn is actually worthy of celebration. Through these parables, we are offered the invitation to consider the transformational power when we both believe and that what we have and what we have to offer is, is valuable. And when we offer that, when we receive that for ourselves, when we offer it for others, we are invited to like let ourselves be found. And we are invited to join in God's longing for all things to flourish in life with God. And I want to invite us to do a couple things in response. I want to invite us to some response, reflection, and then into um, a time of sharing the table with each other in time of communion. And I think about, um, I think about this invitation of longing, this model of the woman, of God's longing, of the invitation for us to long for God. And I think about um, my first beginnings with Jesus. So I was in high school. So junior year, I became best friends with my friend Heidi, and we were kind of connected at the hip, hung out all the time. And um, her parents were religious. They went to church, and they said, if you want to go out on a Friday night, you go to church on a Wednesday night. That's the rule. And being the best friend I was, I would just go with her. And so I would end up, and they were kind of moving around, trying to find places to go. So every week, we were, like, joining new youth groups. And no one really knew us, but we'd, like, kind of do our time and go hang out with our friends on Friday and Saturday. And I remember, like, this was my first introduction to any kind of language around relationship. And I was kind of, like, compelled I actually had no culture. I had no understanding or concept of what it mean, what it meant to like respond to Jesus. And so time after time, I'd go to these youth groups and they'd always offer an invitation at the end, like close your eyes, raise your hand, you know, stand up, whatever. And I just was like, yes, yes. I actually thought everyone said yes. I thought that's what you do, you respond. And so I think it was about like nine or 10 times <laughs> that I would just stand up or I would raise my hand or I would like, close my eyes and look around. And, and one time I even raised my hand. There were only like eight of us in the youth group and I raised my hand and everyone's eyes were closed, but I kind of peeked and no one else did. But I was like, that's weird. Um, why wouldn't you want to respond? I don't understand what's happening. I actually have no idea. What am I supposed to be doing actually? And it was like maybe nine or 10 times and I hit this moment where I was like, oh, here it comes. <laughs> Getting ready. And I just felt like God said, like, you're good. You're good. You're good. You don't, you're worried that I don't see you. Or maybe you're worried that I don't believe you. <laughs> but you're good. And it just was this invitation to say, like, I can walk with you. I can walk with you in this yearning you have to know me. I can walk with you in this yearning to, kn to know what does it mean to follow me or to worship me. And it was a long journey. <laughs> it was a long journey. And I continue to learn and grow and press into this invitation to be found by God. And as you think about your life with God, what are you longing for? What are you longing for? Where are you longing to be found, to be seen by God? I think of this woman in the parable, like Jesus chose to offer this parable in this mixed group of religious leaders. I think of like the, you know, like their ascots and I don't even know what religious leader, you know, but like these are like the elite. And he, he centered the story of a poor woman who is desperate to be, to be valued and to be seen. And I think of the ears of those people who are like, 
that's my sister. That could be me. And Jesus elevates the margin and says, like, you are seen. You are found. But I think about how tempting it is to be the Pharisee, about how tempting it is to be kind of tied up by our understanding or our limited, our limited ideas or perspectives and our lack of longing or our lack of curiosity or lack of question asking even limits us. And I wonder in what ways we today need to be freed what ways we need to receive the invitation to not be limited by what we know, but to be curious and walking in like that radical dissonance that Jesus offers when he creates a table of people that just never would come together. And I wonder even with resentment, like what are ways in our own lives we look at people who maybe are not like us, and it bothers us that they get to love Jesus. And we wonder, like, why, if I'm doing everything right, I'm not getting what I want? And I wonder how Jesus might want to free us from resentment, from the judgment of others, or from this apathy that just disconnects us from the nature of God's kingdom. And lastly, I just wonder, like, where are we longing to flourish? Where are we longing to to live into this radical, upside-down nature of the kingdom that says, like, you are worthy of being pursued with this unrelenting love, and even you get to live in lightness and live in freeness and live in joy and flourish. As we move into communion, I want to read this little passage And um, I think it just captures this, like, I love the language. It says it's like the absurd life with God. And I think that's what the upside-down kingdom of God is like. It flips all of these values that we have about authority and power and faith and worship, and it flips it upside down. And it says the lost are actually the ones who are found, and the weak are actually the strong. And as we go into communion, I just invite you to think about Where are you longing for more of God? Where are you longing for more of God's life within you? And where are you longing for more of God's, like, awareness of God's activity around you? This is from Brendan Manning. He wrote the um, Ragamuffin Gospel, and this is from The Furious Longing of God. The gospel is absurd, and the life of Jesus is meaningless unless we believe that he lived, died, and rose again with but one purpose in mind, to make brand new creation. Not to make people with better morals, but to create a community of prophets and professional lovers, men and women, who would surrender to the mystery of the fire of the spirit that burns within, who would live in ever greater fidelity to the omnipresent word of God, and who would enter into the center of it all, the very heart and mystery of Christ, into the center of the flame that consumes, purifies, and sets everything aglow with peace, joy, boldness, and extravagant, furious love. This, my friends, is what it really means to be a Christian. Let me pray and invite the worship team to come up, and we'll move into a time of communion and response and invitation to connect with Jesus around the table. God, we are here together because we are yearning to know you and to love you and to learn how to know and love you well. And God, we know that this isn't just an act of our mind. It's not just an act of like learning and memorizing and and kind of checking the dots, checking the boxes, but it's an act of our heart. It's an act of our, um, it's it's a submission of our Um, assumptions and our presumptions of people and our um, and our willingness to ask questions and to be curious and just press into who you are and Lord you even 
treat grumbling Pharisees who are like gossiping about you with such grace by saying, actually, I want to teach you something. And so as we come to the communion table, would you help us to remember that we are here because of you, Lord, because you have loved and you have lived and you have died and you have risen to give us life and to invite us into a flourishing relationship with you, with each other, and in this world. And I pray that with grace you would teach us how to do that well and in a way that that just reflects and reverberates the grace and love we have in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.